Well, folks, this is lesson five. Um, and it has to do with the genre of wisdom, and we'll look at what that means. Um, again, the, the point of this, lesson five, which means there's four other lessons you, you, you should have gone through. If you haven't, go back and check out that in the playlist. I think it would be beneficial. Um, these lessons are not supposed to be exhaustive lessons, meaning you're not going to learn every single thing, every single detail within that genre. What it is, it's supposed to, it, it's like an appetizer. So the point of it is not to overwhelm you. The point of it is for you to learn some uh, of, of the things that are important in understanding various genres, how to read them, the sort of stuff to pay attention to, and then, you know, jump into the study itself. In the description box, there's a couple of books uh, that I have uh, recommending you guys to, uh, to learn these things. Number one, there's a book called How to Read a Book. That's just general Mortem Radler's book, How to Read a Book. It will teach you how to read properly. Most of us don't know how to read. Uh, what I mean by that is that we know how to recognize letters and words and sentences, but we don't know how to read in regards to different genres, topically connecting them, uh, what happens you know, when you read a fairy tale versus you read a narrative versus when you read a, a historical autobiography or something like that, and then find common themes through them. That's when you've like hit the epitome of proper reading and thinking. The other book I have in there is... Um, how to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And I highly recommend that book. That is not really a scholarly, uh, sorry, that's not an academic level book. It's scholarly, but it's not an academic level book. And so it will benefit you quite a bit. It's an easier read. And then for more advanced readers, I recommend, and that's in the description box, with the link, Introduction to Biblical Interpretation by Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard. This comes with a workbook as well to help you through that. So, Highly recommend that. You go through this book, you're going to be good when it comes to your interpretation of the Bible. So, lesson five, the genre of wisdom. What are we looking at when we think and talk about wisdom literature? Well, here's some of the stuff we think about it. The wisdom books of the Bible are the book of Proverbs, the book of Job, and the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, it's important to note that there are other parts of the Bible that have wisdom in them. So, for example, some people have uh, called the book of James in the New Testament the Proverbs of the New Testament. So, James has wisdom within it, wisdom literature within it. The Psalms have some wisdom literature in them. So, there's quite a bit of wisdom literature out there, but we're looking at these things kind of categorically. Um, so... Uh, so Proverbs, what, what are the Proverbs? What are Proverbs, period? So Proverbs are short statements that are memorable um, and can be applied to the daily life of a person. That's the, that, that is all cultures have Proverbs, right? All cultures have Proverbs. It's stuff your grandpa told you. It's stuff that your, your dad told you. It's your grandmother's wisdom to you. It's your mother's wisdom to you. Um, and uh, the, these things just generally will help you in life. Job and Ecclesiastes are a bit of a different category. So Job and Ecclesiastes are stories. They're actually narratives. So you, one of the things uh, that you need to bring together when you're reading Job and Ecclesiastes are two previous lessons that I've done. You have to know what a narrative is, and you have to know what poetry is, and then you also have to know what wisdom is, because Job and Ecclesiastes employ three genres. Narrative, wisdom, poetry. And if you don't understand how to read those three genres, you're going to misinterpret Job and Ecclesiastes. You're going to code it out of context. You're going to think uh, Ecclesiastes is teaching things like uh, there is no afterlife because you're misreading the text. You're going to read Job and think um, uh, this is just like God playing around with humanity and just messing with humanity. 
But if you have the proper understanding, like it's a, there are stories or statements that are questioning the more serious questions or realities of life. So example, uh, these things deal with suffering and evil and meaning, purpose. These are sort of higher level questions that uh, we ought to be asking, we should be asking. And the Bible doesn't shy away from asking these sorts of questions. Um, something else that you might see in narrative form that's a prophetic book, that's one of my favorite books in uh, the Old Testament, is the book of Habakkuk. Now, Habakkuk is not it's not considered wisdom literature. It is considered a prophetic book that's prophecy in within... Um, so it's a prophetic book, and there's a narrative aspect to it, obviously. But it also... Um, you can say unintentionally provides a great deal of wisdom as to where we stand in reality, what's, what God's purposes are. There are things that God is doing that we might not be aware of, but we're in the midst of actually going through those experiences. So have your genres properly explained before you, know, you, you move anywhere else from that. So... <sighs> So James says in James 1.5, right? Wisdom uh, is the ability to make godly choices in life. And, you know, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he will give it to you. Correct. Um, I, so in, in James's case, I think what he means is maybe day-to-day -day wisdom. It, it, things that are going on within the Christian community that where we lack wisdom and we pray and we ask God. And God will give us the ability to make sense of those things and make proper decisions. But one of the other things is that God has actually given us literature in which he's communicated wisdom to us. He has communicated general truths to us. And those things are important. So here's a way to think about wisdom literature as well. A person acquires wisdom not by receiving divine revelation even though these wisdom texts are actually written within the divine revelation, but by recording observations about what works or fails to work in daily life in the world God created or created by God. This sort of wisdom literature or the roots of wisdom literature um, lie in what we call creation theology. Creation theology meaning that there are things you can observe from the created order. So an example of this would be, uh, you know, go, stat, go study the ant, you sluggard. Right? Um, a lazy man turns in his bed like a door on the hinges. You get the imagery there. So these are all proverbs that are coming from, you know, doors and ants. And other people, you know, I walked by the home of the lazy person and the wall was torn down and it was sort of a mess. Um, and, and you get the point. So do not be like that. Get up and do work. Move around. So th again, getting you to understand, hey, work is a part of godliness. Work is a part of um, the wisdom that God has communicated to us. So again, wisdom literature focuses on uh, people and their behavior. Uh, and the point of wisdom literature is for people to act or live well. Wise people will, here's a wise statement, wise people will generally live a good life, a well-rounded life. Now that doesn't mean, uh, I'm not talking about healthy, wealthy kind of stuff, but their lives, their children, their homes will be well-run, well-governed. Um, I'm very sure all of us have observed the lives of wise people versus foolish people who continuously make foolish decisions. Their lives are a mess. Uh, wisdom literature is a genre. Uh, wisdom literature as a genre is different than the concept of wisdom in general. And I've been kind of cross speaking between these things. Studying the literature focuses more on the written content than just assuming things to be wise or not. So we're not necessarily talking about whether this thing is wise or not. It's, it's in the literary form what's being told to us. We'll look at some examples as we go through this, and I think it'll be a bit more clear for you. So 
um, guidelines to understanding this stuff. Uh, one, one of these things is that the, the book of Proverbs and Proverbs generally are not legal guarantees from God. So when you read the Proverbs, they are not absolute statements or covenantal agreements and promises that God has given you. That is not what Proverbs are. Uh, again, like you said, because they're general truths. So here's an example. Uh, be not one of those who gives, uh, who give pledges, who put up security for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should your bed be taken from under you? So people will look at this and they go, oh man, that means, you know, I essentially can't give collateral is what's going on. And, and, and they come up with a rule as though the Bible is saying, this is absolutely a negative, you can't do this. And, and then so they have issues with, say, buying a home or buying a car or various sorts of things. They don't develop their credit score or something like that. This is not what this is saying. This is giving you a wisdom that is generally true. It's like, look, if you have debt and you probably can't pay that debt back, don't go into debt and put up something as collateral because then, then you'll use, you will lose your home, essentially. So don't take unnecessary risks in life. And that's a principle that could be applied about most things. Again, not a guarantee, but it's giving you some wisdom on how to deal with that subject. Um, not, so so here's, here's one that I've heard a lot of uh, moms and parents kind of come about. You know, train up a child in his way, and when he is old, he won't depart from it. And people think that this is a promise from God that if you train up a child in his way, and the Hebrew there is ambiguous, by the way, in whose way, very important question, whose way, whether that's God's way or the child's way, it intentionally is ambiguous, I think. And so, so people think that's a promise. They go, oh, I raised up my child in a godly way. I raised him up in the church. I prayed for him. I read scripture with him and to him, and he read the Bible, and now he's departed from the faith. God has failed me. And it's go, no, that is never a promise that God made to you. That's a proverb, and the proverb stands true. Let's put it this way. The proverb is essentially saying, in whatever way you raise up a child when he is old, he won't depart from it. The idea there, it is more likely that in whatever way you raise up a child, when he's old, he won't depart from that way. And again, that's generally true. If you raise up your child as an undisciplined kind of spoiled kid, when he is old, he won't depart from that. And if you raise up your child, uh, say, in, in godliness, you raise up your child in, in kind of wisdom, in, in virtue, when he is old, he won't depart from that. Now, again, that's, I don't think that's a guarantee that that child will necessarily be a Christian. Whatever theological perspective you take, th that's not a guarantee. Whether you're more on the Reformed side or on the non-Reformed side, your theology doesn't correspond with that. But if you raise up your child within a godly household, his habits will probably be god godly. That doesn't necessarily mean that he will be following God, but he'll have good habits in life. Um, Proverbs must be read as a collection. The wise statements must be balanced with other wise statements. So you get chunks within Proverbs as well. But whenever you read a proverb, make sure that, uh, again, that, that, that goes with the idea of that this is not a promise. And it might say something like, the righteous will, pro I'm just making stuff up here, but the righteous will prosper before the Lord and the wicked will fall before the Lord. And then what do you see? you see the sort of opposite of that. The, the righteous are suffering and the wicked are prospering. And these are questions that come up in the book of Psalms. Why is it, O oh God, that we see these things happening? Why is this wisdom, uh, this wisdom that we see and should be like that, it's the complete opposite of that. And so that becomes problematic. Proverbs are worded to be memorable, not to be theoretically accurate. So again, they're meant to be memorable so that you can teach even children. They'll remember it so that they don't make unwise statements in life rather than theoretical accuracy or, or theological accuracy even. Right? So in, the, in Ecclesiastes, if it says something like that, like, like this, 
uh, you know, I saw the chief end of man being that he dies and goes to the grave. That's a proverb that he's observing like, man, like I just, when I look at life and I'm observing, it seems like the purpose of life is people just die. They're born and they suffer and they die. That's not meant to be a theological opinion on the afterlife. I've heard people misquote out of Proverbs on the afterlife so much. And they wouldn't do that if they only understood what it was that they were actually reading. And they're not reading a theological treatise, but they're reading a, uh, they're reading wisdom literature that is poetic and a narrative um, at the same time. So, uh, so here's one. The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. So you get a contrast there. I highlighted those things so that you notice that um, these things are opposites. They're contrast, hedge of thorns, level highway, right? You would want to walk on a level highway and not in a hedge of thorns. And then uh, the, the other comparison is obviously between the lazy person, the sluggard, and then the upright individual. So you, you remembered this because of their contrast um, and then their, the parallelism that's happening there. You can go back and look at the poetry section that I did in, re in regards to recognizing kind of parallels. I'm going to give you guys kind of a numerical, what I call a staircase parallel uh, in a little bit. And I think it's a really cool passage and it's funny too to look at. Some Proverbs need to be translated to be appreciated. And, and by translated here, we were speaking about it being understood in our cultural context. Because those cultural assumptions no longer exist in the modern culture. So there might be things that are mentioned. There might be things that are mentioned that we just don't have access to in our culture. Here's an example. Proverbs says, It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Quarrelsome wife. So most homes in the Western world or in the United States don't, do not have corners on their housetops because they don't have flat housetops. People don't go and live on their roofs. They don't go and like kind of um, sit under the sun. They don't have canopies where they spend, uh, you know, the night under the, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, on their roofs. Uh, people's roofs don't look like that. So you go to the corner of a roof, wait, my roof is like this. And again, the point here is understanding the imagery. And if you look at, most Middle Eastern homes today, Middle Eastern homes in the ancient world, you had flat roofs and people actually used their roofs. They would go on top of their roofs, right? They would actually, when they would get married or their sons would get married, they would actually build a second story and then their, their children would live there. The married children would live there. And they actually kept building like that. Um, on the property, but it, it's flat. And if you don't have that imagery, you don't know what a home looked like, that needs to be explained and translated to you. Sometimes there's idioms that are used that we don't understand and things actually need to be translated. And again, this is why we have, <laughs> this is why we have multiple Bible translations and we have like translations like a dynamic equivalency translation like the NIV that does a really, really good job when it comes to poetry and wisdom literature, and might not, so you might not be very interested in a dynamic equivalency when it comes to translating the letters of the New Testament that are straight up teachings, because there's quite a bit of interpretation in dynamic equivalencies, but you want quite a bit of interpretation in, in when you're understanding poetry and wisdom, because some of those things don't directly translate into our cultural context. So, Use multiple Bible translations, you guys. Don't be like, oh, I just read literal translations. If you read a literal translation, like the NASB of Proverbs, of Psalms, of Ecclesiastes and Job, uh, it, it's going to be very choppy. It's not going to have the flow that it, the original text actually does. Sometimes in the poetry, there's a certain kind of buildup based on the Hebrew alphabet, and you completely miss those things because you know, it's, it, it hasn't been translated for you. Here's an example of a, a, a form of a proverb, and it's, it's an example story reflection. 
Um, and then so there's an opening, there's an example story, and then there's a moral uh, that you're supposed to gain from this. And this is the way this proverb reads. Um, and I mentioned this earlier. I passed by the field of the sluggard, or the lazy man, by the vineyard of, um, of a sluggard, of, of a man lacking sense. Something's up with the, I caught, the way I copy-pasted that. By the vineyard of a man, I think it's supposed to say, uh, lacking sense. So I passed by the field of a sluggard, the field and the vineyard are parallels there. The sluggard, him being lazy and lacking sense, are meant to be um, parallels there. Okay? And then he goes, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles. So thorns, nettles, that's a, it's building up as to how bad this guy's uh, you know, yard is, essentially. His field is. And its stone wall was broken down. So he has no protection. Then I saw and considered it. So now he's going to tell us kind of the reflection or the moral of the story. I looked and received instruction. So again, notice the poetry there. I saw, I saw, and then it says I looked, same exact thing. Considered it, received instruction, same exact thing. Right Now here's the moral of the story. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. So you get there, right? Sleep, slumber, folding of the hands. To rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber. And want like an armed man. So the robber and the armed man are paralleled there. there. Want and uh, a robber are paralleled there. The moral of the story is not that you shouldn't rest. The moral of the story is that you shouldn't rest too much. So you shouldn't be lazy, right? Your life shouldn't be explained by a little sleep, a little slumber, folding of the hands. You're constantly kind of resting. And you can observe this in society. You can observe it in certain cultures where they have kind of a more mellow existence to them. And they're not very successful politically, economically, individually in people's lives. Um, And again, I want you guys to understand this wisdom that's been given us. And this wisdom specifically has to do with observing your fellow man and learning from the mistakes of your fellow man. So for example, if I said, I observed someone's life and it was full of anger and rage, And his end was miserable. The idea there is, don't be a man full of anger and rage. Because generally speaking, if you're a man of anger and rage, your end will be miserable. Now, you can be a very calm man and your end still be miserable. But that doesn't mean the proverb is not true. Because it's a general truth that we're talking about here. Um, there's, uh, okay, so I want to pull this up and look at it with you guys, because uh, I, I just think uh, this is really funny. And you guys, uh, so this is out of Proverbs 30. Here's an example, right? It says, three things are too wonderful for me. And, and so this is going to build up, Okay. Uh, the title essentially is there are three things that are beyond me. They're wonderful for me. Okay, wonderful in the sense of too much for me to understand. And then the way it builds up and says, four, I do not understand. This text has just told you that it's going to mention three things and then give you a fourth. And the point of him doing that is to help you understand that the point of the text is the fourth one. The rest is, um, it, 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 it's a build up to that. It's the excitement to it. It's, it's um, kind of the climax of it, right? So there are, you know, three things too wonderful for me, four I do not understand. He says, the way of an eagle in the sky. He says, man, the way of the eagle in the sky, I don't understand it. Again, this is not meant to be theological or theoretical. This is not saying there's no way people can understand the way of the eagle. If people use it that way, then they're misusing it. 
Uh, so he speaks about the sky, and then he speaks about the ground, uh, the way of the serpent and the rock. So we have sky, we have the ground, and then guess what we're going to have? The sea, all things covered. And the way of the ship in the high seas. And then he mentions the fourth one. And the way of a man with a virgin. Or the, man, uh, the way of a man with a woman, with a maiden. And this is hilarious, right? Because not much has changed. The idea here being that, hey, th- th- there's things I just don't get. And, and the stuff I don't get is the, the way of the eagle in the sky, the way of the, the, what the serpent does in the rock, the, the way of the ship in the ocean, and guys with girls. Because guys, the, the idea is that go- guys lose their minds when it comes to women. Men don't have, they, they, you kind of go, what happened here? You just got infatuated or in, you fell in love with this girl and you've lost your mind. We can't understand your ways. You started, you became someone else. And so I, I love this text because it's funny and it's true. It's true a lot of the time. For those of you guys who, um, who are old enough and have had the experience of, you know, being infatuated with a girl, falling in love, And kind of you start doing weird stuff. You change. All your friends are like, dude, what happened to you? This proverb is about that. Now, if you pay attention, this proverb goes on to speak about what? Well, hey, it's thematically continuing. This is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done nothing wrong. So that's essentially the the women, the woman theme is continuing, but it's now in a different sort of context. Um, just one thing about your Bible translations that will help you is notice that the ESV translators have done this indentation for us. And the reason why they've done that, I'll do it like that so you see it and you'll notice this in your Bibles. So notice the way of an eagle in the sky is paralleled with the way of a serpent on a rock. And that's paralleled with the way of a ship in the high seas. And then that gets into a parallel with this fourth part. So that's it for our lesson on wisdom literature and how to understand it. This is lesson five. Again, if you haven't watched all the other ones, I recommend you go watch them. They're about 20, 30 minutes. I think they'll be beneficial to you in regards to understanding what you're reading when you're reading the Bible. That's the first question you ought to ask when you're reading your Bible. You you should say, what am I reading? Because without an answer to that question, if you don't know if you're reading apocalyptic literature versus poetry versus narrative versus Pauline epistles um, versus parables that Jesus is giving, more likely than not, and here's some proverb for you, more likely than not, you're, you're going to misinterpret what you're reading, misapply it into your life, and then maybe even worse, misapply it into the lives of others. Or even worse than that, expect things from God that God has never promised to you. Or whatever. Mm-hmm.